ACAP and ACAP are releasing today. Um, we are all very, very glad that you were able to join us today. And just as an FYI, we're experiencing higher than anticipated attendance. Uh, so if you have colleagues and friends who are interested in, in joining us, uh, we will be making the recording for this entire webinar available immediately after the event um, on both the Center for Health uh, Care Strategies and ACAP website. Um, we're thrilled at the interest that the topic has generated. Um, and I, I want to say that ACAP is also very excited to be presenting the report that underlies this webinar. Uh, we commissioned it uh, for the purpose of getting a better sense of what states are doing to require and incentivize managed care organizations to engage in social determinants of health. So we have all known for a long time that work in this area has been ongoing, uh, and now we have a sense of exactly um, how deep um, it is going. So um, with that, uh, we can turn to the next slide, please. Um, the report itself has been posted already on both the Association for Community Affiliated Plans and the Center for Healthcare Strategies website. So uh, if you haven't, you can take a gander after the, the website. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be turning the mic over to our speakers who are going to talk to the report itself and to the key findings, as well as make a few policy recommendations. Uh, and then we are very glad to have the expert perspective of a CEO of a Medicaid health plan that ACAP represents. You can move to the next slide, please. I'd like to thank uh, our speakers, Trisha McGinnis, who is the Senior Vice President at CHCS, as well as Diana Crumley, a Program Officer at CHCS, uh, both for presenting on today's webinar and for their excellent and remarkable work on assembling this uh, very useful report. In addition, I would like to thank Anne Kenyusik Yoakum, the CEO of Hennepin Health in Minnesota, uh, for her participation as well. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Trisha. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking ACAP for supporting and partnering with us on this important project. As most folks in the audience know, there's a lot going on these days within Medicaid agencies, health plans, and providers to address the social determinants of beneficiaries' health as a means ultimately to improving overall health outcomes and lowering costs. Next slide, please. There's also a wide variety of mechanisms that states are using to fund and catalyze this work, including payment reform, accountable communities of health, programs targeted to high-cost, high-need patients, and other mechanisms. While many reports and resources aim to help providers design workflows and tools for innovative social determinants of health approaches, this report focuses and addresses how state Medicaid programs have implemented policies to incentivize this work and what federal policymakers can do to pave a path for this work, with an emphasis on Medicaid managed care and 1115 demonstrations. For the purposes of this project, we conducted a comprehensive scan of the approaches that state Medicaid agencies are using in their managed care contracts and in their 1115 waivers. What sets this report apart from others is that based on, it is based on a comprehensive review of all 40 states with some form of Medicaid managed care and 25 states with approved 1115 waivers, not just leading state examples. The report captures a comprehensive view and assessment of how states are addressing are using managed care contracting waivers and the flexibility provided in 1115 waivers to try and address social determinants. For state managed care contracts, we reviewed the base template contract that is publicly available. So not necessarily all contracts with MCOs, which can vary um, from, from MCO and contract to contract. Uh, so this report is really based on a view that looks at health plan requirements, which may or may not flow down to healthcare providers. Um, so I think it's important for the viewers to note that. Also, there are uh, a lot of 1115 papers in place. So that for the purposes of this project, our team really focused on a subset of those that include delivery system reform incentive uh, payment demonstrations or DSTRIP, and demonstrations that included healthy behavior incentive programs, work in community engagement requirements, and managed care programs. Next slide. 
think it's also brief, uh, we're important to briefly note what is excluded in this report. Um, given that today's audience includes a wide range of stakeholders. First, uh, in many instances, there are already clearly defined social determinants related Medicaid programs or services, such as home and community-based services, non-emergency medical transportation, health homes, targeted case management, and we did not include those in this scan. There are also social determinants related requirements or incentives within the Medicaid program that often exist outside of managed care contracts and waivers. So for example, Minnesota's Integrated Health Partnership Program directly encourages providers to partner with community-based organizations to address social determinants, but those program requirements exist outside of the managed care contracts, so those would not be reflected in this report. And so with those caveats, I'm going to move on to the next slide and provide an overview of the key findings. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start today's webinar by briefly highlighting some of the high-level trends um, that we noted as a result of this comprehensive scan, scan of 40 contracts and 25 waivers. And then I'll hand it off to my colleague, Diana Crumley, to delve into much greater detail on these trends. Um, first, there was a notable um, growing focus on social determinants of health within state managed care contracts. Uh, 35, contract, 35 states, for example, include some requirement around social determinants um, within the care management and coordination requirements. Uh, states are using a wide variety of mechanisms to, to weave this in. So why by, by far most frequently used the care coordination and care management requirements. And within those, um, one common approach is to require plans to one, screen for social needs, and two, to provide linkages to community resources. But beyond those kind of fundamental requirements, there's a tremendous variation in how states are using their authority to have plans address the social determinants of health. States are also beginning to insert social determinants requirements into the quality improvement and measurement requirements within their managed care contracts. 15 states explicitly linked these requirements as well to other programs that they had, particularly around delivery system and payment reform, really in an effort to, within the contract itself, link what the plans were doing around social determinants to related work that was going on at the provider level to transform how care is delivered and paid for and create a very explicit connection. While payment incentives uh, directly linked to social determinants of health strategies are not yet commonplace, they are beginning to emerge and we think will probably become more commonplace uh, within the contracts as a way to incentivize rather than um, simply require certain activities. And then uh, on a final note, it, it's worth noting that while there is a fair amount of flexibility in how managed care organizations can leverage their capitation payments to pay for social determinants, services, and activities, most states, um, as of yet, do not provide great detail on how NCOs can use those flexibilities under federal law, uh, at least not explicitly within the managed care contracts themselves. Next slide. Within the 1115 demonstrations, also a few notable findings. Um, first, again, uh, similar to the managed care contracts, there is a dominant focus on enhancing care coordination and community partnerships to address social determinants of health. So whereas the MCO contracts tend to focus on screening and referrals, 1115 demonstrations really extend, um, extend that reach and, and in addition emphasize MCO partnerships or provider partnerships with community-based organizations. Secondly, within the 1115 waivers, there's also greater use of payment incentives deployed to address social determinants, uh, specifically by more directly relating value-based payment approaches to efforts to address social determinants of health. States are using their waiver authority um, also to provide healthy behavior incentives, but they do not at this point explicitly link those, um, those behavior incentives to efforts to address social determinants of health. Um, which could be a missed opportunity. Um, finally, it's worth noting that in two states that are using work or community engagement requirements for eligibility, they are um, encouraging their health plans um, to play a role in helping their members meet those requirements. Next slide. 
So just a quick overview of how we've structured the deep dive into some of the nitty-gritty details uh, that you'll find in the report um, that's available on the ACAP and CHCS website. We've structured today's discussion around kind of two core components. One is, our, is around systems and partnerships. How is the state building the infrastructure and processes needed to address the interrelated health and social needs of low-income Americans? What types of social determinants related activities are states requiring or incentivizing? So in this category, we'll discuss the care coordination and management, as well as the quality assurance and program improvement um, aspects of, of this work. The second component really focuses on authority and funding. Is the state using an existing flexibility in federal law or requesting new specific authority to provide traditionally non-covered services that address social determinants? How is the state financing social determinants-related work? How is the state um, ensuring um, an effort to sustain this work? So within this category, we really discuss additional services, NCO payment incentives, and the use of value-based payment mechanisms to drive this work. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Diane Crumley, who's going to dive into the details. Diana? All right, next slide. As Tricia noted, we will start first with a discussion of how states set standards surrounding the systems and partnerships that can address social determinants of health. In this section, we will discuss two concepts, care coordination and quality assessment and performance improvement. Next slide. First up, we discuss care coordination and management. Most of what we found was related to this activity. 35 states had some kind of care coordination provision relating to social needs or social determinants. And just as a note here, we have promoted to DC, DC to state status for the purpose of this presentation. Next slide. What do we mean by care coordination and management? Medicaid programs historically provide a defined set of mostly medical services. States look to MCOs to not just provide these services, but figure out a better, more coordinated way to provide them, given the holistic needs of each member. This naturally leads to a consideration of services and needs outside the medical space. We sought out provisions that made these expectations explicit. Of course, some contracts provided more detail than others. In our report, we refer to two functions, screening and linkages. The category of screening would include assessing social needs via a health risk assessment, for example. MCOs must arrange uh, for members to be screened within a certain period of time and are subject to more advanced screening requirements for certain populations with long-term services and support needs and special health care needs. MCOs use the results to inform care planning and risk stratification for population health management. In the category of linkages, coordinating services with and referring members to community and social support providers would fall under this category. We also often refer to closing the loop, and that essentially refers to tracking referrals and making sure that health-related resource needs are met. Next slide. As an example of a contract requirement, Kansas has very detailed expectations surrounding social determinants of health and independence. The state defines SDOH in a familiar way, referring to environments in which people are born, live, work, play, worship, and age. But the state also defines social determinants of independence an individual's goals that help them achieve sustainable improvements and advancements in their lives. The contract also notes that addressing social determinants of independence in conjunction with social determinants of health accelerates an individual's path to higher levels of independence and attainment of their vision for a good life. Throughout the contract, Kansas reiterates the importance of social determinants of health and independence to its care coordination processes. It requires health risk assessment questions on domestic violence, housing, and employment, and includes an example of that health risk assessment in the contract. 
It also requires dedicated community service coordinators that ensure linkages to community resources and support for education, employment, and housing. In the realm of 1115 demonstrations, North Carolina has an exciting new pilot program relating to social determinants of health. The demonstration uses a not so exciting title, Enhanced Case Management and Other Services. But the program has since been rebranded as Opportunities for Health or Healthy Opportunities. In its approval, CMS notes that it's its first of its kind. Those pilot services are targeted towards members with identified health-related resource needs, housing, food, transportation, and interpersonal violence. For example, in addition to assistance with applications and referrals to social services, the program also covers home repairs or remediation relating to mold or pest infestation to the extent that it is influencing a health condition like asthma. Health plans are responsible for identifying eligible members and reporting data necessary for the pilot's rapid cycle assessment. Lead pilot entities are responsible for directing, directly contracting with community-based organizations and social service agencies, and throughout the length of the pilot will increasingly be subject to outcomes-based payment arrangements. In December 2023, the state will submit a plan to CMS outlining how the state anticipates it will incorporate effective pilot program services into its managed care program. And just a note, our report also discusses how the more established delivery system reform incentive payment programs or DISRIP develop SDOH focused projects and partnerships with a specific emphasis on care coordination. Next slide. Next, we will discuss quality assessment and performance improvement. 13 states have provisions relating to social determinants of health in this area. Next slide. What do we mean by quality assessment and performance improvement? Plans must have an ongoing comprehensive plan for these activities. The plan should include a consideration of performance measure data and mechanisms to assess overutilization and underutilization. Performance improvement projects or PIPs are a big component of the plan. These PIPs have an embedded baseline assessment, evaluation, and implement implementation cycle as outlined here. Next slide. Here we provide two examples, both with the theme of disparities. California discusses possible interventions that address disparities, and DC builds upon this theme with an explicit consideration of social determinants of health as a component of the quality and performance improvement plan. Next slide. Now we will discuss the category of authority and funding. Here we ask whether the state is using an existing flexibility in federal law or requesting new specific authority to provide traditionally non-covered services that address SDOH. We also discuss the role of MCO payment incentives and value-based payments. Next slide. Twenty-four states have some additional services provision in their contract or demonstration. Next slide. Now, what do we mean by additional services? Well, in the contract context, we refer to two types of services with different implications for capitation rate setting, value-added services and in lieu of services. Plans can use these authorities to provide additional services that address SDOH. These services are in addition to, or presented as a substitute for, services in the defined state plan Medicaid benefit package. Section 1115 demonstrations also may add authority for additional services. And we already discussed one example here, North Carolina's demonstration. Next slide. Okay. 
So in the realm of contracts, Texas has a long-standing value-added services provision that provides more detail than most contracts. The contract provides several examples of value-added services, such as wellness programs that aim to achieve healthy lifestyles or additional transportation services. Plans fill out a template for value-added services, and that template is in turn incorporated by reference into the contract. The approved list of value-added services can then be publicized on member materials. MCOs in Texas may also provide something called case-by-case -case services, which do not require the same approval process. Plans can authorize these services on the basis of medical necessity or cost effectiveness. Massachusetts 1115 creates a funding stream for a new category of services provided by accountable care organizations, ACOs. A recent amendment clarified that funding can go directly to social service organizations to ramp up capacity. These flexible services include home modifications, pre-tenancy services, and home delivered meals, and can be provided to a subset of beneficiaries with certain risk factors. On December 3rd, MassHealth announced the rollout for the flexible services program scheduled for January 2020. Next slide. Three states have MCO payment incentives relating to SUH. Next slide. We looked for SUH-related targets and withhold arrangements, incentive arrangements, and penalties. We did not include targets such as certain quality measures relating to readmission rates that may inspire plans to address SUH that do not directly relate to SUH. Next slide. A notable example here is Michigan's Pay for Performance Program. Three components of that Pay for Performance Program include references to social determinants of health, the population health management intervention, low birth weight, and emergency department utilization focused bonuses. Most notably, plans design a population health intervention that addresses social determinants of health. The program has three stages, baseline analysis, intervention proposal, and intervention reporting. It functionally looks similar to a PIP. The contract also notes the state's particular interest in the relationship between healthcare and housing. Next slide. 10 states have value-based payment initiatives relating to SDOH. By value-based payment, we refer to a broad range of payment initiatives that seek to move away from fee-for-service payments and towards value, not volume. Next slide. Some examples here. In its contract, New Mexico allows MCOs to delegate care coordination functions as part of a VBP arrangement. One of the functions that can be delegated is linkages to community and social support providers. In its 1115 demonstration, Rhode Island gives infrastructure incentive, fund, incentive funds to accountable entities, their version of ACOs, that can be used to build capacity in addressing social determinants of health. For example, the AE can develop partnerships with CDOs with these funds. In program year one, 10% of incentive funds must be allocated to partners who provide specialized services to support, among other things, social determinants. The state also includes a social needs screening measure in their VBP model. Now I'm going to turn it over to Trisha again to discuss the recommendations. Next slide, please. So it, we very briefly um, were able to, it was a, since it's an only 60-minute uh, webinar, we want to make sure we have some time for good Q&A. Uh, the presentation that Diana just gave really just kind of lightly skims over some of the, the key findings. So we definitely encourage folks to check out the report, um, which dives in much more deeply and provides a, a really rich wealth of examples um, that we were unable to present on today's webinar. But out of this work, um, after we conducted the scan and analyzed the results, 
uh, we identified five recommendations specifically for federal policymakers. Uh, these, um, there's probably a whole, there, we know that there are a host of recommendations that could probably be made to state Medicaid agencies, but for the purposes of this discussion and the report, we really focused on what might federal policy uh, makers do to help um, continue to spur, to spur um, state innovation around social determinants of health? So that's what we'll focus on today. So next slide, please. So we have two key recommendations around systems and partnerships. Uh, the first really is uh, to make it easier for vulnerable populations to access needed health services and care coordination. We know that effective social determinants strategies really require healthcare organizations to engage beneficiaries over a sustained period of time. Um, that is a big part of uh, the return on an investment that can be reaped by doing that. So during uh, what one of the things that we're recommending is that during its review and approval processes, CMS could suggest modifications to 1115 demonstrations to help reduce eligibility churn and improve member engagement, um, including roles that MCOs can play in really helping members maintain their eligibility and satisfy any community engagement and work requirements. The second recommendation really is to enhance agency collaboration at the federal level. Collaboration between health and social sectors at the state and community level can be greatly enhanced by greater collaboration at the federal level. Targeted federal partnerships and cross-agency councils, such as the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, can help make collaboration on social determinants more commonplace at the state and community levels. Second slide. The next set of recommendations really focus on um, issues concerning authority and funding. So the first recommendation in this subset is to really provide additional guidance on addressing social determinants. States and MCOs are not yet effectively tapping into the abilities of health plans to pay for in lieu of and value added services. When CMS issues guidance to Medicaid agencies, states listen. And our finding is that states could really benefit from guidance on ways to use in lieu of services and value added services to provide upstream social determinants interventions in ways that are consistent with federal regulations, such as how to develop uh, rates that address premiums, how to add these services uh, to provide social determinants interventions, how states can direct plans to use their quality assurance and performance improvement processes to test effective social determinant strategies. These are all things that we think um, with a little bit more guidance from CMS uh, would greatly propel states um, to adopt and um, provide greater guidance to their MCOs around what's allowable. The second recommendation is to improve 1115 demonstration, approved 1115 demonstrations that test strategies to address social determinants of health. A CMS could approve state uh, 1115 demonstrations that test the impact of targeted social determinants interventions in managed care. So by using the flexibility and evaluation components of the 1115 waivers, CMS can greatly support innovation in this space and an assessment of what works on the ground. And fin our final recommendation um, for federal policymakers is to support outcomes-based payments for social determinants interventions. Pay for success models can allow states and MCOs to pay only for what works. So building on precedent established by the Social Impact Partnerships to Pay for Results Act, CMS can identify ways in which the pay for success model could be adapted in Medicaid managed care and enable investments in social determinants of health. Next slide. So just to wrap, um, definitely encourage folks to go on either CHCS's website or ACAP's website to download the report. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ann Kenyusik Yokum, the CEO of Hennepin Health, who's going to share some insights about this perspective um, working at leading uh, one of the leading edge MCOs. Anne? Thank you. 
So again, my name is Ann Knesek Yoakum. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Hennepin Health, which is a managed care organization and a health maintenance organization that's located within Hennepin County, Minnesota. And I'm going to present on our work addressing the social determinants of health. Next slide. So just to give you an overview of my presentation, I'm first going to touch on a couple of topics here at our state policy landscape in Minnesota. Then I'm going to talk about Hennepin Health, uh, whom we serve here in Hennepin County, as well as our unique Hennepin Health structure. And then finally, to highlight a few of the initiatives that we have piloted addressing the social determinants of health. Next slide. So first, to talk about our state policy landscape here in Minnesota, we're very fortunate to have a Department of Human Services, which is our state purchasing organization that is really innovative and that has for many years looked to address the social determinants of health as a part of our medical assistance program. Uh, here, our prepaid medical assistance plan, or PMAP, as well as our Minnesota Care product, which is our BHP here in Minnesota, is bid at least every five years under a longstanding waiver that we have in Minnesota. In the most recent bid, which was for the 2016 plan year, the Department of Human Services had questions for managed care organizations, including Hennepin Health, that focused on the social determinants of health. And Hennepin Health, along with our competitor managed care organizations, all responded uh, to the procurement with examples of how we address the social determinants of health. And that was a part of the procurement process and a part of how our Department of Human Services awarded those bids. Next slide. Another initiative that I want to highlight that wasn't included in the CHCS report because it's not directly tied to an 1115 waiver is a very large state innovation model grant that the Department of Human Services and our Department of Health had here um, in Minnesota. And um, in addition to being a joint effort, it was used to test new ways of delivering and paying for health care through what's called an accountable health care model. Um, this, as uh, the presenters mentioned earlier, was really uh, provider-centered. It expanded patient-centered uh, team-based care, team care through service delivery, and it focused on integrating medical care along with social services, behavioral health, and other long-term care. Um, through what's called an integrated health partnership. Next slide. Uh, this project was, in fact, very successful. We had a very large number of Minnesotans uh, who received care through a Medicaid accountable care organization here in Minnesota. And in addition to that, there were tremendous cost savings as a result of the integrated health partnership. We've seen that our Department of Human Services has issued a request for information that might in future years lead to an enhanced model of these integrated health partnerships. And we're waiting to see what that looks like, but we're certainly hopeful and we're certainly advocating with our uh, regulators here in Minnesota that as the IHP model moves forward, that it will incorporate the social determinants of health as a central component. Next slide. So just to talk a little bit about whom we serve here at Hennepin Health, uh, we are a single county managed care organization, but we serve the most populous county in Minnesota. We serve a tremendous range of communities uh, from inner city neighborhoods to some of the wealthiest areas in our state, as well as some rural agricultural areas. We have seen increasing poverty levels during the first decade of the century. And in addition to that, we also have seen very significant racial disparities in families living in poverty, and that also correlates very closely to some well-documented health disparities. Next slide. So just to move on to the Hennepin Health structure, so as we look at how we serve Hennepin County, Hennepin Health is a managed care organization and a licensed health maintenance organization that operates within the larger Hennepin County structure. Uh, we have a number of colleagues within our structure including Hennepin Healthcare, which is a large provider system that operates the state's largest safety net hospital, North Point Health and Wellness Center, which is a FQHC that operates in North Minneapolis, as well as our colleagues in public health and human services who 
run a wide range of programs that address public health services such as vaccination, maternal and child health, HIV, and operate our emergency mental health services as well as some other clinical services. And then we also have a human services operation that addresses the social determinants of health through programs that uh, work on housing, SNAP, emergency cash assistance, and a wide range of other programs, including child well-being. So within this entire county system, Hennepin Health works to coordinate care and really look at ways that we can, in an innovative way, address that whole person uh, through the whole combination of county services. Next slide. So talking more directly about our accountable health model at Hennepin Health, here at Hennepin Health, we take our capitated reimbursement from the state Medicaid agency or the Department of Human Services, and we use that in cooperation with our county partners. Uh, with our county partners, we have a shared electronic health record, which assists us in being able to share data effectively and really be able to um, address many of the issues that would be difficult to address in isolation. And we also have a risk sharing funding model that allows us to take the capitated dollars that we receive at Hennepin Health and to reinvest them in projects that are important for the entire healthcare system and to really be able to look at some of those upstream interventions. Next slide. So just to close out, I want to highlight a few of the innovative projects that we have here at Hennepin Health, starting with our social service navigation team. This is a team of social workers and community health workers that are employed by our human services department, but that sit here within Hennepin Health. This team facilitates access to services across Hennepin County, um, including SNAP or our services for individuals experiencing food insecurity, um, our housing services, um, withdrawal management, which is a service that assists um, persons who are struggling with substance use disorder and that is gonna be approved um, as a part of the Medicaid program in a state plan amendment in July of 2019. Um, our criminal justice, uh, emergency cash, so a, a wide range of different services. I also wanna highlight some of the work that we're doing with eligibility and enrollment supports. Um, like many Medicaid plans in the country, we've seen tremendous churn in our eligibility and a large number of people who are losing their eligibility, some of whom due to the improving economy, but most of whom due to paperwork issues or to the fact that many people don't even know that their eligibility is up for renewal. And we've highlighted a number of interventions, both here at Hennepin Health, where we can remind members of a need to renew their eligibility, as well as looking at it more holistically um, throughout the county, where we can use some of our county partners to ensure that we're reminding people that they need to renew their eligibility not just um, if they're Hennepin Health members, but also if they are members of other health plans, recognizing that ensuring that people remain eligible is good for our county eligibility workers, it's good for Hennepin Health and our health plan partners, it's good for our provider partners, and most importantly, it's good for our Hennepin County residents who are on medical assistance so that they, they can have that continuity of care. Next slide. Uh, next, I want to address our work in housing. We have a couple of different initiatives that we've worked on here, uh, one of which is the development of an indicator for persons who are experiencing homelessness through data analytics. And that looks at items such as a zip code where a person is living um, or where a person is reporting to receive mail. And there's a high correlation between receiving mail at the general delivery zip code here in Minneapolis and being a person who's experiencing homelessness. And so through those data analytics, we can determine um, who is more, more likely to be in need of housing assistance, and we can help to make many of those connections. In addition, uh, we also have individualized work with enrollees to identify housing goals, um, to assist people in getting into various housing programs that we offer here at Hennepin County and at our community partners. Uh, to help people locate and submit required documentation, as well as um, some staff who are certified to be able to submit some of that documentation and to submit statements uh, to assist people in getting into housing programs. Next slide. 
Uh, in addition, we also have redesigned our primary care clinic so that it's more multidisciplinary and that it's really focused on doing some intensive intervention for very complex uh, patients who require medical, behavioral health, dental, and social services that are co-located so that we don't have people going um, from you know, one system to another at multiple locations and trying to access multiple programs and services. So it's really more of a streamlined experience. Uh, we've offered extensions into the community and we've also created an access clinic at Hennepin Healthcare, which is again our large safety net hospital that's dedicated to Hennepin Health members where we can really provide more of a comprehensive experience. And if you look at the right, you can see that they, we've actually had uh, some research that can document the success of the Hennepin Health model, and that's been in some very exciting peer review papers that we've had that have documented how really addressing uh, health in a comprehensive way has been successful in reducing the total cost of care and in improving the health of our members. Next slide. Uh, finally, just building on the CHCH report, I want to highlight our efforts related to the new enrollee survey. So as CHCH mentioned, uh, this is a regulatory requirement, and like many health plans, I think we initially saw it as just a requirement, but as we thought more about it, we realized it was both a, a requirement as well as an opportunity to connect with our new members. And we received the base survey, again, from the Department of Human Services, so our regulator, with an opportunity to modify many of the questions. And so we took that opportunity to develop an iterative process where we launched initially a very basic survey, and then we reached out to our county and community partners to determine whether or not there are other questions that would be helpful to ask um, as a part of the process so that we can learn not just um, the health plan questions that we want to know, but also questions that might be of interest to public health or human services as we really work to address the more comprehensive healthcare needs of our members. Uh, certainly it's been a challenge. We have many difficult to reach enrollees. Uh, here at Hennepin Health, a high percentage of our members are persons who are experiencing homelessness and it can be difficult to reach that group of people, whether it's by mail or, or by telephone or in other ways, but we're continuing to work to refine the survey and to use it not just as an effort to uh, ask some of those health plan questions, but really to look at health in a more comprehensive way. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jenny uh, to moderate questions. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anne, and thank you also to Diana and Tricia for your presentations. Um, before I jump into Q&A, I do want to respond to a number of the notes that we have been seeing uh, on, in the question panel about the slide. So yes, in addition to the recording for this webinar and the report itself, the slides will be sent to all of the registrants uh, for this uh, webinar um, after the event, likely tomorrow morning. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. And so we've also been trying to track as best we can the questions that are popping up on the question panel. Um, why don't I start with this one? Um, are states requiring standardized tools for social determinants of health screening and data collection? Yes, thank you. This is Diana. Um, we noticed a number of state examples in this area. Um, as I noted earlier, uh, Kansas has an example health risk assessment in its contract. North Carolina publishes um, standardized questions for public comment and I believe is in the process of finalizing those standardized questions. And there's been a huge impact of um, the accountable health community questions in this area and the presence of validated questions in this space. And I, I expect that states will um, in increasingly use these questions in the context of a standardized um, requirement. Um, for data collection, Minnesota has a very robust uh, disparities initiative um, where race and ethnicity data should be reported um, and Arizona also has a suggested program where um, they're essentially integrating or, or suggesting integrating the homeless management information system and using that data um, from that um, HUD database to identify members who are experiencing, experiencing homelessness and uh, enable care coordination um, and management for those members. 
And this is Trisha. I'll just note that there are states that have explicitly decided not to require a standardized uh, screening tool. So, for example, Massachusetts, as part of its 1115 waiver, um, really deferred to the Medicaid ACOs to determine what type of screening tool they wanted to use um, as, as one example. So, so we really see a mix of states prescribing specific tools and states leaving it more flexible, particularly states where there may already be great penetration or use of tools um, either by the MCOs or by the providers. Um, and I'll also note that there is um, some emerging research uh, that's unfolding outside of this context that's really looking at ways um, to use back-end coding as a way to be able to synthesize results that come from a variety of different tools and really synchronize those so that Medicaid agencies and payers might be able to look across an entire population whether or not the tool is consistent or not. Thank you. And here's a question for Anne at Head and Pin Health. Um, did uh, you uh, custom, by you, um, I, uh, I imagine this means your, your health plan, customize the Hennepin Health shared EHR to include fields for social determinants of health? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's a, a somewhat complicated question. So we do have information that goes into our shared electronic health record, which uses the EPIC system. Uh, to address the social determinants of health, but as other folks who are familiar with the EPIC system may know, it's relatively difficult to um, customize that system in a way that um, is accurate for all of the different parties that are accessing the system. So we do feed in um, social determinants of health information to a number of fields, and we have a couple of fields that are customizable uh, in the system but it's not uh, a universal response to that particular question. Thank you. All right, I believe um, this is a question actually for anyone, probably the CHCS folks, but has anyone defined outcomes of interest rather than process for social determinants of health? Yeah, this is Diana. Um, we know of um, certainly demonstrations that um, try to build in an evaluation plan and have suggested health outcomes that they're tracking through the various care coordination projects um, embedded in the demonstration. Um, for example, California and its whole person care pilot um, pilots evaluation plan um, specifically um, has some measures relating to um, the percent of people um, who were homeless that eventually received housing. Um, as I noted earlier, North Carolina has rapid cycle assessments for its pilot program. So um, the, the purpose of that rapid cycle assessment is to actually track the outcomes associated with some of these services and to you know, add effective services and remove ineffective services. And of course, um, to the extent that um, quality assessment and performance improvement um, projects um, have this embedded evaluation component and they're addressing social determinants of health in that context, um, there will be some tracked outcomes. Um, but of course, since this is healthcare, um, a lot of the health outcomes are things that would be relevant um, to um, a, a payer. Um, such as reduce emergency department utilization, um, unnecessary readmissions, and things like that. And this is Trisha. I'll just this, this could have you know easily I think been one of the recommendations that we provided um, to federal policymakers, which is just you know outcomes measurement, both kind of social determinants related um, outcomes and related health outcomes. You know really. Gal, you know, galvanizing and figuring out what the measures are and endorsing measures around those, I think, is, is really going to be an incri a critical part because this is a very, a very nascent part of the work for sure. And and our findings were were pretty limited um, in this in this realm, at least at, at le least at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from the audience. Um, how are states and feds, and I imagine health plans, making sure that community-based organizations that are partnering to uh, make these services available are adequately funded. So how are CBOs adequately funded in this situation? 
certainly this is a, a challenge that um, we see that often comes up in the context of SCOH initiatives. Um, uh, the 1115 demonstrations, um, delivery system reform and improvement, um, um, incentive of payments, those typically go to healthcare organizations. So sometimes there's a, a natural limit into uh, how much um, that those monies can flow down to community-based organizations. But we're seeing um, changes in that. For example, Massachusetts recently um, clarified in its demonstration that funding can go directly to social service organizations to ramp up that capacity. Um, and North Carolina in its demonstration actually requires that a percentage of funding flow down from those lead pilot entities down to the actual pilot providers and so ensure that um, those, um, those providers are actually receiving some of the incentive monies um, associated with the effectiveness of their intervention. Thank you. Here's another question for Anne from Hennepin Health. Um, Anne, what do you see as the advantages and disadvantages um, in terms of the ability to integrate social determinants of health initiatives for organizations that are both payers and delivery organizations? So from our perspective, I really think that we see primarily advantages in the ability to provide that integrated suite of services. We found it to be tremendously effective to be able to leverage our colleagues on the provider delivery side to address a number of the social determinants of health. And there are you know, a variety of examples of that, including some of our co-located social services staff and um, also some opportunities to do some data interchanges between the organization. So really, uh, we see primarily advantages in the sense that it uh, allows us to really take that comprehensive look. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a disadvantage, but certainly one challenge is ensuring that we are appropriately uh, addressing residents' privacy concerns and expectations, and that, and, you know, as we're looking to work across different departments within our county, that we're really being respectful of our members and ensuring that they have an understanding that we're working together collaboratively and that as we uh, work to streamline services, that um, there is a common understanding of what those benefits are. Thank you. Um, here is another question for our CHCS folks. Um, um, and we have touched a little bit on this, I think, but sometimes information on return on investment for these types of interventions is unavailable or, um, or it's too early to tell us. So do states often incorporate uh, an evaluation plan for their social determinants of health initiatives. Um, in addition to that, have you seen any um, good data on ROI? Um, thank you. Yeah, so most 1115 demonstrations have a fairly robust evaluation plan. Um, so you often see that um, being embedded to the extent that social determinants of health um, is included in the context of some of those care coordination payments. I provided some examples from California and um, North Carolina earlier. Um, so I think that that would address the question there. In terms of ROI um, calculators, I know there's a number of tools available um, that can be accessible for payers and determining what the likely effect of um, an intervention would be. Uh, okay, thank you. Oops, sorry. Uh, another question for CHCS. Have any states used or considered using payment penalties for managed care organizations? Yeah, so we captured some of this um, in our review of MCO payment incentives. Um, New Mexico uh, has something called the delivery system performance target in their contract. And it's actually tied to a penalty rather than the traditional withhold arrangement or incentive arrangement. Um, and they essentially require that 3% of their members um, should be served by a community health worker. 
Um, so that's an, one example of a very specific um, penalty associated with SDOH, but certainly there are a number of other penalties that may exist that are, are tied to quality indicators as well. Thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions related to care coordination in the lineup. Um, one, um, how is care coordination defined and measured? Uh, uh, two, uh, how is it usually provided is another question related to care coordination. Um, can anyone on the phone provide a response to those questions? Perhaps Anne can give a, a real world example. Uh, certainly we discussed a little bit about the general outlines in federal rule, what's required of plans. Um, they, they must screen um, members and then, you know, uh, coordinate with community and social support providers. Um, but she probably can give uh, much more of an on-the-ground perspective there. Yeah, so again, our social service navigation team, in cooperation with our clinical team, really does a, a look at a member's entire suite of healthcare and social service needs. Uh, and we have, for example, uh, persons who are experiencing um, substance use disorder and also have co-occurring mental health needs as well as um, physical health needs and then also you know may for example need assistance with the housing system and so we have care coordination staff here as well as our social service navigation team who really works to uh, coordinate all of the services and to make appropriate referrals and then in addition to that to in a very intensive way um, assist with documentation um, if there is documentation needed to get into some of those social services to assist with uh, making appointments helping a member get rides and transportation uh, to their appointments so really to provide a very comprehensive package of care coordination for those very complex members Thanks, Anne. And I think I have another one for you. A um, couple questions related to technological challenge or technology challenges and data sharing. Uh, perhaps they're related, but did, did you, uh, the state, uh, the health plan, uh, encounter any significant technological challenges? And if so, what were they? And then perhaps related, um, how do you best share data, uh, you, the health plan, with your community-based organization um, partners? Okay, so I can tackle the first question um, initially. So related to the technological challenge. So the answer is yes, we have certainly had some technological challenge. And I would say that the primary technological challenges that we have faced relate to the fact that, you know, as in many uh, states and in many um, other organizations, we have some uh, systems that are really in need of, a, of an update or an upgrade and that's something that we've certainly been advocating very strongly for at the state level and um, so there are a lot of systems that don't talk to each other and so um, in some cases we've been able to overcome those technological barriers, barriers and to um, share data in a robust way um, in other cases we've had to do things like go to uh, you know paper-based or excel-based reports and and we're contacting members to, for example, remind them of eligibility based on those kind of um, older uh, sort of anachronistic systems. So yes, we face technological barriers. Uh, and then with regard to the um, additional questions related to data sharing, I think that, um, you know, overall, we found that our county partners and our community-based organizations have been uh, relatively open to opportunities to look at data sharing. Uh, certainly, I think that that's easier within a county-based system where oftentimes we're operating on a single uh, platform and we can more effectively share uh, data than we can with some external entities. Thank you so much for that answer and for all of the others. And this brings us to the top of the hour. So I would like to one, thank our audience. I really appreciate everyone's attention and interest in this topic. 
And two, I'd very much like to thank our three speakers, Anne Kenyusek Yocum, CEO of Hennepin Health in Minnesota, and Diana Crumley and Tricia McGinnis of CHCS, both for their presentations and their work on this tremendous uh, report. Um, again, as I mentioned previously on this call, um, we will be making uh, the report, the slides, and the recording all available to all registrants of this uh, uh, webinar, and also uh, the report and the recordings will also be available both on CHCS's and ACAP's website. So uh, please check them out. Thank you so much for all of your questions, and everyone have a great day.